So one of the things that has made my life easier over the years as a desktop Linux user is Git and services like GitLab and GitHub, because that's what I use to back up all of my dot files, all of my config files. That's what I use to back up all of my suckless builds, things like my build of the surf browser and dmenu and things like that. I just push all that stuff to my GitLab and it's there. I never have to worry about losing it. You know, I never have to worry about what if the hard drive fails in this computer? You know, what if some catastrophe happens? I don't have a, a local backup. It, does, it doesn't matter. It's all on my GitLab and it makes distro hopping so much easier. Those of you that distro hop a lot, now I don't distro hop much these days, but those of you that distro hop every few days, if you are not using Git to store all of your config files, you have no idea how much of a headache you are causing yourself by not using something like Git and GitLab. So today I wanted to show you my usage as far as Git and GitLab. You know, I have some pretty basic needs, but I do have several repositories over on GitLab and I will show you how to get started. And I, I think you guys will find that it's much easier to get into Git than some people make it out to be. I think a lot of people put learning Git off for a long time because they think, well, it seems complicated when you watch people do it. It's all command line stuff. And, you know, some of the commands may not make sense to a new user. You don't really know what's going on and, and it can seem scary, but it's really not. I promise you, after watching this video, you guys can have your own GitLab repository set up and you can start backing up your dot files today. So the first thing you probably want to do is just go ahead and sign up over at GitLab. So if you don't have an account over at GitLab, sign up. Once you have an account, um, such as my account here, you see personal projects. These are all the repositories that I have created. Well, these are 10 repositories that I've created. I've got a few more than that. If I go to projects and go to your projects, it will actually list out all the repositories I have over on GitLab. Now, when you sign up after you've got your account, what you want to do is you want to create a new project. Basically, this is a new repository and this repository, I'm going to call it test. Yeah, we'll just call it test and the project slug, which is the URL. So your URL, of course, will be gitlab.com slash whatever username you created slash and then the project slug test is fine. You need to create a project description. I'm going to say this is a test for my video. All right. And then what is the visibility level? Do we want it to be a private repository, meaning nobody can see it but me? Do we want it to be public so everybody can access it? Unless you have a real need for it to be private, most people probably are creating public repositories. Typically, you want to create a private repository uh, if you're... You shouldn't be doing this anyway because it's immoral, but if you were creating proprietary software, closed source software, you didn't want to share with the public, or maybe you had some sensitive information, but most people that are working on open source projects, of course, are doing everything out in the open in public repositories. Now, uh, you can also tick on this box as well, initialize the rep repository with a readme. So any repository you create, if you ever create a readme, it needs to be readme, all caps, dot md for a markdown file or readme all caps.org for an org file. And if you want it to go ahead and just create one for you, you can tick that box on and later you can go back and edit that readme. And then let's create that project. And that is it. And then it immediately takes us to the test repository I just created. There is a readme file, but there's nothing in it. It's just the title and the description. And uh, we can actually edit this repository if we want. Now let me pull up a terminal. So let's open up a terminal to run some Git commands. Let's start learning the basics of running Git at the command line. First thing we want to do is we created that new test repository over on GitLab. We need to clone it to our local machine. And what you could do is go to the clone tab here and get the URL. Just copy that URL, then go back to your terminal and then type the command git clone and then the URL of the repository we want to clone. And in my case, it's that test repository. And then it clones it, meaning that wherever we were in the directory structure, I was in my home directory. There should be a test directory there now because that is what we just did. We cloned that directory. I can CD into test. And when I do a LS, you see, it's still just an empty directory. It has that readme.markdown still there. But 
nothing else. We haven't added anything else to this repository. We could edit that readme.markdown, so I could do a vim readme.markdown or nano or emacs, or if you wanted to, you could open up in a graphical text editor like gedit or kate, whatever you want to do. I could add another line such as this is another, well, if I can type line of text, and then let me write that and quit. And then now that we've modified that readme.markdown, we need to push it back to our GitLab, right? We've changed it. So we need to push it to that remote repository over on GitLab. So to add something, you need to run the command git add and then the name of file. Get add readme.markdown in this case. Now what you could do if there were several things in this repository, several files, and you modified half a dozen of them or however many, instead of having to add each one by file name, you could do a git add space dash u, meaning git add all the files that have been modified or updated. And that's what I'm going to do. So I did git add dash u, and then if I run git status, it's going to give me the status of this repository, and it's going to say that I have one modified file, meaning that's one file that needs to be pushed to GitLab, right? Even though I added it, it's in a staging area. It's really not on GitLab yet. It's really not moved anywhere. It's just something that we could do something with at this point. So to take this to the next step, what I need to do is I need to commit it. So I need to git commit dash m for message and then write a message, you know, what you modified in this file. It needs to be something rather short but descriptive for people. If, if other people are using your repository, other people are pushing to it, it helps them know exactly what kind of changes you made to that document. So git commit dash M, I'm going to put added another line. <laughs> All right. And then hit enter and it says one file changed, three insertions, one deletion. So it's just telling you a little bit about how you modified the file since the last push. And then you actually need to push the file to your repository. So I'm going to do a git push and it's going to ask me my username over on GitLab. So DWT1 is my username. Of course, you're going to have a different username. It's going to ask for my password. So let me open up my password manager here and get my password. And I will show you guys how to avoid using these passwords here in just a second. All right, and that's it. We just push that to GitLab. Now, all I need to do, let's go back to the browser and let's just make sure our push worked. And there is test. We have two lines of text. Now, you could have a million documents in this repository, this test repository or any repository. But by default, the document, it always shows is the readme file. So if you have a readme.md or a readme.org in a repository, that is always the document that it shows as a preview in your repository. Another very important file that you probably should include in every repository is a license file, and that is license, all caps. And if I wanted to, I could do add license. Just click it in GitLab. You could, of course, create it yourself on your local machine. Just open up your text editor and write a license and then push it. But it's so much easier on GitLab itself because you just hit the add license button and tell it what license that you want to license this under. Is there templates? Yeah. So if I wanted to license uh, license it under Apache or MIT or the GPL or whatever, I'll just choose GPL. There, we've got a copy of the GPL. And then all I need to do is scroll down. Now we could add a commit message. There's a default commit message here, add license. That's good enough. I don't know why you would need to uh, do anything more than that. Then commit changes. And that basically does everything that we would have done in a terminal. It just does it on GitLab. Now, most of the time, you're not going to want to be doing this kind of stuff on the GitLab website. It makes sense for the license because it's so straightforward. But most things you're going to do on your local machine. And then after you do them on your local machine, change whatever files you're changing, you're going to open up a terminal. You're going to do a git add name of file, git commit dash m, then the message, and then a git push to push it to your GitLab. Let me go back to the main page of this test repository here. And now you see we have two files in this repository. We have the readme.md and we have the license. I'm going to go back to the terminal. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a new document in Vim. I'll create a new document. We'll call this doc 
1.1.md. We'll make it a markdown file. And I'll just start typing something. So this is some gibberish exclamation point. That's good enough for now. Let's write and quit. If I do an ls, you see now we have doc1 and we have the readme. Uh, there's also the license file on the remote repository. We may eventually want to pull that down. Matter of fact, let's go ahead just to make our repositories completely synced so they have the same stuff. Let's do a git pull. So if I do git pull instead of git push. So when you do a push, you will, anything that you have in the staging area, anything you've committed goes to the GitLab repository. When you do a git pull, anything on the GitLab repository that is different from what you have locally gets pulled to your machine. I hope that makes sense. So let's do a git pull and let's do an ls. And now you see, now I have the license on my local machine, but now doc01 is on the local machine, but it is not on the remote machine yet. So let's do a git add and I could do dash u for any file that's been updated, but that's not going to work here. I'll try it, but git status. Uh, there's nothing here because git add dash u is just for files that we've pushed to GitLab before that GitLab knows about and that have been updated. We've never done anything with doc zero one here. So this time we actually do need to do git add and then the name of the file. Hit enter. And now when I run a git status, see new file doc zero one dot md and then we need to commit it so git commit dash m and then the name of your message adding doc o one dot md will be my message and then finally you need to do a git push again it's going to ask for your username and it's going to ask for your password all right and we have pushed doc zero one if i go back to the browser to the gitlab test repository and refresh you see that file is now actually there we could review it now imagine we've had this test repository going for a while and we have stored hundreds maybe thousands of documents in it config files and for whatever reason I lose my computer or I have to do an extreme distro hop and I didn't have any backups. So let me clear the screen. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do a RM dash RF, very dangerous command <laughs> on the test repository. I'm not in the root directory. Let me CD back into root and then do RM dash RF test. And when I do an LS, there is no test repository. I just blew that repository away. It's gone. Well, did I lose? All my documents, did I lose the doc01.md and the readme.md and then the license file? No, because they're all they're all still on GitLab. And remember, all you need to do is go get the clone URL. So do do the git clone again. So grab that URL, go back and do git clone the URL, cloning into test. Now when you do an ls, test is there if I wanted to cd into test just to verify do a ls and there you have it we didn't lose anything now you can go much deeper with git there's a lot of advanced stuff you can do with git especially once you get into development projects you you start doing things as a collaborative effort with other people maybe working on open source software because then you have to worry about creating other branches other than just the main branch or the master branch you know you're probably going to have development branches and you got to worry about merging everything together and you know you got to take your commit messages a little more seriously than what i was doing here you know there's a lot to get but for most desktop linux users that just want to back up their dot files the commands I've already shown you are pretty much the ones you're going to use all the time. There's really not any others. You're going to use git add, you know, to add something to a staging area, git commit, and then the name of the message. And then you're going to do git push to push it to your GitLab or git pull to pull it from your GitLab if, if they're out of sync. Or you're going to do git clone name of URL if you need to clone a repository. Some other commands you'll occasionally use. I don't use these very often, but if you wanted to view the log, you could do git log. And as the name implies, this is just a log of what's been going on with this repository. Who's been committing what? <laughs> you see all the, the latest commits, which there's just the four or five that I've made since starting this video. Exactly the files that I was adding or removing or whatever it was I was doing. And then you have the basically the hash for each commit, the, the number 
Some other common git commands include git branch. If you needed to create branches, I don't ever do that because, again, I'm just working by myself on my own stuff. Uh, you could do uh, git fetch and git merge and things like that. Those are often going and grabbing something from a remote repository and making them work with the local repository. I actually found a great diagram when I was uh, getting ready to do, do this video because visually it's hard to kind of visualize what exactly Git does. I think that's why so many people have a problem with Git, but I found this great web page that actually has a visualization of actually what goes on when you run the various Git commands. So imagine you have four working areas basically of git you have the working directory which is that directory that you have that local repository on so so my test directory that we've been playing in that's the working directory when i run a git add it takes it to the next area which is a staging area when i run git commit it takes it to the next area which is the local repository or the head and then finally when i do git push it takes it to the remote repository or the master and then if you want to go the other way, git fetch takes something from the remote repository, the master, and brings it to the local repository, the head. Git merge would take it even further from the local repository all the way back to the working directory. Or when we do git pull, it just takes something from the remote master repository all the way back to the working directory. So I, I'm really glad I found this little uh, graphic here. This is actually pretty neat. I think that when you see it, I really think it helps beginners to get um, able to understand what's going on because just having somebody open up a terminal and typing these commands, you really can't figure it out. <laughs> it really is hard to grasp. Even when I was trying to figure out all the Git commands, you know, some of this stuff can be kind of hard to wrap your mind around. One good thing with GitLab is they have fantastic documentation. So they have like the GitLab basic guides and it tells you all you need to know about how to work with the GitLab website, how to use Git, you know, just your standard command line Git commands. It'll tell you how to get SSH keys set up so you can use SSH keys for your GitLab. And what this does for those of you that are not familiar with SSH keys, these are keys that when you remote into another machine, you don't have to enter a password, right? Because those machines are trusted. You know, those machines know each other. And with GitLab, if you're constantly pushing and pulling and doing Git clones and things like that, you don't want to have to be entering username and password all the time. If you have these SSH keys set up, what it does is when I run a Git push in my test repository, it's going to know who I am because I have the SSH key on my machine here, my local machine. I also have the SSH key on my GitLab account. And so these machines know each other. I don't have to verify that I'm me. Let me run through the basics of setting up the SSH keys for those of you that have never done it. You need to run the following command, SSH-keygen. We want to generate a new SSH key, space-t space RSA. So this is the type of key we're creating RSA. I, this is the uh, encryption space dash B for bit size, the number of bits that are going to be part of this key. 2048 is the minimum most people recommend and it's the minimum that GitLab recommends. By default, if you don't do the dash B flag, it defaults to 1024. But for security purposes, you know, to make it a stronger key, you really should do at least 2048 and then give it the dash C flag and then typically some kind of description, typically an email. So I would do something like Derek at distrotube.com. And I would hit enter. I don't want to create a new key, though, because I've already got one. I CD back into my home directory and I CD into .SSH. You have a hidden folder in your home directory called .SSH. If I run it ls, you see I have id underscore rsa. That's the file it creates when you run that command. If I open that file, which I won't do because it contains the key. <laughs> the key is in that file. Copy that key. Then what you need to do is go back to your GitLab page and go to the top right and go down to settings. And let me uncollapse the sidebar here. You have SSH keys. Click on that. And then you have this window here with this box. Paste the key that you got from that file, that id underscore rsa dot pub. Paste 
the contents of that file into this. And then this button here, add key, is going to turn red. Click add key. And you've added the key. Now once you've added the key, now instead of using HTTPS to do your cloning and pushing and pulling and all of that, you can use SSH to do all of that and you will not be asked for a password. So I've gotten back into the test directory and what I'm going to do here, I haven't added anything or committed anything, but if I ran a git push, just to show you guys, it's going to default to asking about my username for HTTPS colon slash slash gitlab.com is using the standard web address. Let's make it use SSH instead. And how you do that is whatever git command you're with push, pull, clone, whatever, git push, and then do git at gitlab.com colon dwt1 slash test dot git. And that forces it to use SSH and you see it didn't ask me for a password or anything and it tells me everything is up to date. There was nothing to do anyway because I hadn't committed anything new. But had I done it with just a, this is the standard HTTPS way, it was still going to force me to use a, a password, you know, enter a username and password, and then tell me everything is up to date. So that was just verifying that my SSH keys are in fact working. So I think that's really where I want to stop with this basic Git and GitLab tutorial today. One thing I do want to mention is my dot .files repository, which has you know, all of my configs for my tiling window managers and various other programs. This is not a standard Git repository. This is what is called a Git bare repository, meaning my home directory is not really a repository. I mean, technically it is because uh, I push all of this stuff from my home directory on my local machine and it goes to this dot files repository over on GitLab. But you can't really make your home directory a Git repository if you're going to have subdirectories in your home directory also Git repositories because there's going to be some conflicts. You will occasionally run Git commands in those subdirectories and Git will be confused. And it's like, well, which repository are you running this command on? Are you running it in the home directory that's a Git repository or are you running it in the subdirectory, which is also a Git repository? So to get around that problem, what most people do is they'll will set up a bare repository and if I go back to the terminal here let me show you guys what's going on there let me CD into my home directory so my home directory you know I, I could do a git add and a git push and all that but my home directory technically is not a git repository if I CD into this directory the dot files directory this is actually a git repository but when you set up a bare repository, a bare repository means this rep this git repository, this dot files repository stays empty. We're not actually working in this directory. It's technically the git repository, but all the commands I run are going to be on a different working tree. And in my case, the working tree is actually the home directory. I know that's kind of complicated. I did a video on how to use git bare repositories for backing up your dot files oh, a couple of years ago. It's, it's not the greatest explanation <laughs> in that video, but the reason you do that is so you don't have conflicts. If you want to use basically your home directory as a git repository, then the way you need to do that is with the git bare repository. So I think all of you guys really need to start using git. To back up your config files, your dot files, it makes sense. There's no reason everybody shouldn't be doing this. Now I need to thank a few special people. I need to thank Michael, Gabe, Nate, Corbinian, Mitchell, Entropy UK, John, Devin, Fran, Arch5530, Chris, Chuck, DJ, Donnie, Dylan, George, Lewis, Omri, Paul, Robert, Sean, Tobias, and Willie. They are the producers of this episode. They're my highest tiered patrons over on Patreon. And without these guys, you wouldn't know how to back up your dot files using Git and GitLab. You wouldn't know about it. The show is also brought to you by each and every one of these ladies and gentlemen. All these names you see on the screen right now, these are all my supporters over on Patreon because this show is sponsored by you guys, the community. If you'd like to support my work, check out DistroTube over on Patreon. Peace.